Dukkha. August 4th, 1979. As a practitioner, one must be truly committed to Tamma. One's heart must always be turning towards Tamma. One must not allow the flow of the world, which is the Gilesas, to come into one's heart, to trample on and afflict it. For this is the flow of the Gilesas, and they must not be allowed to incite and disturb the heart, which we are taking care of with our utmost effort, to the extent where we are willing to put our lives at stake for it solely for the sake of Tamma. We must constantly be on the lookout for harm and perils. We must not be insensitive to those things which are harmful to us. We must always set up this understanding, and then we can be considered as people who practice Tamma with mindfulness. This mindfulness is the constant awareness of things that are harmful and beneficial to oneself. One must be constantly aware of those things which are beneficial or harmful to oneself. One must be always careful and cautious, and one must get rid of the things that should be got rid of. One should also develop, nurture, and take care of the things that one should be taking care of, and this is our own heart. This heart is the property of two possessors. However, it is the Gileses that have been ruling over it for a very long time. We ourselves cannot make an account of all of the forms of birth that we have gone through, and the process of birth, aging, illness, and death that we have undergone right on up to the present day. This is the work of the Gileses, Danha, and Asava that lead us to be born and die and experience dukkha and hardship. All of them are harmful to us. Every form of existence that we take up is filled with dukkha. Dukkha is inherent in every form of birth, because when one takes up birth, one must also take up death. Both birth and death are a pair or a duality. Therefore, whenever there is birth, there is also Dukkha. The Lord Buddha said that the one whom Dukkha does not fall on is the one who does not take up birth, for this is the only way to totally wipe out Dukkha. If one doesn't take up birth, then one doesn't have to experience any dukkha. If such is the way, then, what is the cause of dukkha? Due to birth, dukkha arises. So what is the cause or origin of birth? The origin of birth is Abhidda, the king of delusion that is deeply embedded within the jitta, to the extent where it is not easy to differentiate or tell them apart. It is therefore necessary for us to commit our total effort to the extent where we will even give up our lives if we have to. When it is time to intensify one's effort, one must intensify it. When it is time to make a hard drive, one must make a hard drive. When it is time to fight, one must really fight. When it is time for one to be moderate, one will know that for oneself when the time arises. However, one should not take it upon oneself to decide when it is the time to be moderate or to take it easy or relax, when in reality the time is not right to be so. Concerning this, one can sometimes be misled. The practitioner himself will know the right time to take a rest, to relax, to enjoy ease and comfort while breaking away from his strenuous exertion. The way to rest the jitta is to enter into the state of calm and cool-heartedness. There can be such a time. But when one enters into battle against one's opposition with the means of satipanya, then one must totally commit oneself to it. One must consider the dukkha as the satsatamma, the truth, and one should not consider dukkha as oneself, for this is the principle of truth and tamma. This is the correct principle which is right and proper. The dukkha that arises within the body is important. It is something that one can see very clearly and distinctively. The dukkha in the jitta can arise as a consequence of the dukkha of the body. This is one aspect of dukkha. The dukkha that arises in the jitta, even at the time when the body is not afflicted with any pain or illness, is the dukkha that is entirely created by the gilesas. The dukkha that arises in the body due to illness or from sitting in the same position for a very long time can cause the gilesas to arise. The jitta will be restless and agitated, and will be concocting various ideas. This is caused by the gilesas of attachment. The jitta will become confused, and will concoct the idea that the dukkha within the body belongs to oneself, and that the entire body is oneself. 
If we see that we and the body are one and the same thing, then when there is dukkha within the body, we will feel that we ourselves are experiencing dukkha. So when we see that we are experiencing dukkha, then we will become concerned with ourselves. We will not want to experience dukkha, and this desire not to want to experience dukkha is vipavatanha. Then we will not be able to look for the truth because we will not be able to find a way to reach the truth or follow the truth principle that says that dukkha is an aspect of truth. This is the principle of the zatatamma, the truth. A practitioner who has clearly seen dukkha within his heart as an aspect of truth will then not be overwhelmed by dukkha, no matter how severe this dukkha might be. This dukkha will not be able to trample on and afflict him or cause him to waver. I have experienced this myself, and I am not speaking without anything to back me up. I have clearly experienced this, and that is why I dare to relate this to you, without being concerned with whether I am showing off or not. I speak from the truth principle, and what I teach is following the truth principle, aiming only for your benefit and befitting the effort that you have made in coming to me for instruction. I instruct you to the utmost, to the fullest. Dukkha vedana, painful feeling, arises from many causes. It can arise from illness. But please keep in mind that it is the same old Dukkha vedana that we call Satchatthamma, the truth. The Dukkha that arises in the various parts of the body, or the Dukkha that arises from sitting for a long time, are all the Satchatthamma. We must take that Dukkha as the target for the investigation. We must investigate back and forth between the heart and the body where it is permeated. Look and see in which part of the body this dukkha has arisen. For instance, the pain in the legs or in the various organs of the body. One should take the point where the dukkha or pain is most profound, and then take that as the point where one establishes one's mindfulness, and investigate with banya, analyzing, differentiating, and isolating the dukkha so that you can see its nature very clearly. We must observe the dukkha to see that it has no other characteristics apart from its being dukkha itself. It is unlike the body which has various characteristics since it is made up of the different parts. We must compare and examine all the different parts, and then we must turn inwards towards the jitta. These three things are terribly important. We must not wish for dukkha to go away because the desire for this dukkha to disappear is dhanha or craving. This will just increase the dukkha, and one will never have one's wish fulfilled. Instead of this being magga, the way for the eradication of dukkha from the heart, or curbing the dukkha within the body, it merely increases or intensifies the dukkha of both the body and the heart. This is the way if one wants or desires dukkha to go away. One must neither make any wish nor have any desire. When dukkha arises, it arises whether we have the wish for it to arise or not. We should investigate dukkha to see it as it actually is. By differentiating and setting apart those things which are involved with dukkha, find out which part of the body is being afflicted with dukkha and take a good look at it. The jitta must be revolving constantly. This revolving of the jitta is actually the turning around of banya, Banya probes and examines for the cause of this dukkha. When dukkha intensifies, then the jitta cannot get away from that particular spot. It must be turning around very rapidly. This is the way of investigating the satchatthamma and the way to contend with one's enemy. One must differentiate the body, look at it, and examine it. One must also differentiate and set apart dukkha vedana and examine that. This vedana is merely dukkha, but in itself, it doesn't know that it is dukkha. And the body, although it might be afflicted with dukkha, in itself does not know that it is so afflicted. Who is the one who says that this body is afflicted with dukkha and that the dukkha vedana that appears is dukkha? Who says that this is so? If it doesn't come out of our sunya, aramana, or memory, where else can it come from? So in the end, we cannot help but look into the jitta itself. Now, if the jitta itself really suffers from dukkha, then let us really look into it closely for ourselves. We must look or see it with banya, see it with discrimination, and see it with discernment. Don't just look simply because we only want to look at it. 
if we look just because we want to get to know without doing any investigation, this is not the way of looking for the truth. The point is that we should not have any desire, but merely to probe and examine into the truth itself. This will be the natural way of investigation, the Madtima way. If we have any desire, then this will be Samudaya, and the cause of Dukkha will arise. Therefore, even if the Dukkha afflicts the body to the extent where it will break apart, then let it break apart. As far as the disintegration and integration of the body is concerned, they are just a pair or a duality. It is natural for them. If they can be formed together, they can also break apart. The main point here is to expose the truth about these three things that are interrelated or combined. See it clearly with banya. One must get to see the pain in the body clearly. One must see it clearly with banya until one can see that the skin is merely the skin and the flesh is merely the flesh. It is the same way with the sinews and bones and the rest of the parts of the body. They are merely as they are. They themselves don't know that they are experiencing dukkha, even though the dukkha is like a scorching flame. They themselves don't know that they are undergoing dukkha, and the dukkha itself doesn't know that it is dukkha either. This dukkha doesn't know that it is making others suffer, so who then is the one who forms up the presumption and assumption about these things? One must turn around and look inside the jitta. When looking at the jitta, one should look the same way one looks at the body and at dukkha vedana. One must look with continuous attention and mindfulness. One must look with the intention of finding out the truth. When one gets to find out the truth, then the jitta will merely know. Can this knowing be one and the same thing with vedana? And if this knowing and vedana and the body are one and the same thing, when dukkha vedana disappears, how is it that the jitta still remains? The jitta has always been here from the day of our birth, but this dukkha vedana only arises now. If they are one and the same thing, how is it that this vedana doesn't appear at the moment of birth? And how is it that it can disappear? It should not disappear if the jitta has not also disappeared, so truly they are not one and the same thing. This investigation must be constantly turning around. As far as the desire is concerned, that is, the desire for dukkha to disappear, one should never bring it into the investigation if one doesn't want to enhance dukkha and accumulate more kilesas, which is samudaya, the cause of dukkha. Then one would be knocked down and one would not be able to make it through. When one is about to pass away, one will be helpless. One who sets his heart to investigate and observe the Satsatthamma is the one who will gain victory and the one who will be able to withstand to the end. Although he might not have got rid of all the kilesas, he would be able to stand on his own with mindfulness, wisdom, sati and banya. Sati and banya are absolutely vital for taking care of the jitta, and when the jitta has attained deliverance, then there is nothing else to talk about. What is there to talk about? In training and disciplining oneself, one must be bold and courageous, firm and resolute. One must not be feeble or weak. One must not see anything in this world as more worthwhile than tamma or than the knowledge and insight that will deliver us from the gilesas and asava that are entangled within our hearts, for we can gradually emancipate ourselves from these things until we are totally free from them. The supreme treasure is the jitta that has attained deliverance, or the jitta that has developed the various stages of virtue. They are similar to the treasure or possessions that we have accumulated. The more we accumulate them, the more valuable they become, that is, their worth and value increases, until we arrive at the state of contentment. We must develop the jitta to this state of contentment. We must not be shaken by the loka tamma, the worldly influences, for they have been as they are since time immemorial. This world is full of birth, aging, illness and death, confusion and trouble that afflict all people and every kind of animal. There is no true peace and happiness in this world. Where are we going to find happiness in this world? We will never find it because there is only dukkha. There is the physical dukkha when one has to strive and struggle to make a living. When we have desire or craving for possessions, this is also a form of dukkha. Whatever form of supposition we set up, we always get attached to it, like a piece of paper which we suppose is a banknote and can be used as currency. 
We know it very well within our hearts that this is just a piece of paper, but we are still deluded with it. Our greed for it is just immeasurable. Lopa and dosa, greed and hatred, are so severe that they shake the whole world. Is there any happiness in them? Lopa, or greed, is one form of fire. When our body is normal, that is, when it is not afflicted with any disease, it is quite comfortable and at ease. But when there is any illness, then the body is afflicted and disturbed. It is the same with the citta. When it is not afflicted with the diseases of the heart, lopa or greed, for instance, it will remain in quite a calm and peaceful state. But as soon as this disease of greed happens to strike the heart, then the heart will turn into fire and become troubled and annoyed. Can't we see its harmfulness? Dosa or hatred is like a shadow that follows lopa. When we cannot acquire the things that we want according to our desires, then we become angry. The world has these things as the masters of the heart. So if this is the case, then who in this world can have any happiness? Because the nature of these things is fiery. Wherever they are, they must always scorch and burn and totally consume that place. Neither happiness nor comfort can come out of them. Even when one dies, if these things are still full within one's heart, one will never be able to find any happiness. One will never be able to find any basis to hang on to. One will die worried, concerned, and possessive of everything. One will pass away in confusion and worry. One will be consumed and burned through to the next birth. One will never come across the real essence at the time of one's passing away. This is because one is deluded with samadhi, conventional truth. One thinks that samuti is the real truth, which it is not, while on the other hand, tamma and virtue, which are the real truth and the treasures that can provide us with cool-heartedness, trust and confidence, are never accumulated by us. So, how are we going to come up with any confidence? Therefore, the building up of virtue inside the heart is terribly important for wise people, especially for us who are the bhikkhus, the practitioners. We must be really serious, really earnest. The Madhima Badibada, the middle way of practice, is always suitable for lifting us out of dukkha. We should therefore depend on and take the Madhima Badibada as our path of practice and as the tool for the eradication of the Gilesas. No matter how many Gilesas there are, they must all arise from the heart. All that is necessary is to develop and produce enough sati and banya to counter the kilesas. When the kilesas are subdued, then happiness will arise. We will then come to see the harmfulness of the kilesas. Whenever the kilesas appear within one's awareness, then one will become afflicted and feel uncomfortable. One will feel ill at ease immediately when the kilesas appear. The more the kilesas appear, the more afflictions we will have to endure. We must curb them with samati, manya, sadha, and vidya, diligent effort. When we manage to curb and restrain them, then we will feel at ease, comfortable, and happy, for this is the quality of one who practices tamma. At the same time, we will realize the harm of confusion and trouble that is caused by the gilesas oppressing the heart. We only have one undertaking or work to do. For a bhikkhu, there is no other work that is really genuine or of any worth other than the work of correcting and uprooting the gilesas. This is the work of extracting the thorn of the gilesas from the heart with our ability. This is in accordance with tamma and follows the example of the Lord Buddha. When we become weak and discouraged, then we should reflect on the Lord Buddha and the Savakas, noble disciples of the past. We should think of them when we take up our refuge. They are our Buddhang Zaranangatami and Sankhang Zaranangatami. But we must not merely reflect upon them. We should think about them and try to follow their example. We have to ask ourselves, are these Zavakas ordinary human beings or are they Devatas, celestial beings? They are people just like us. Some of them even came from the very delicate and high classes, like those of kings, for instance. They had never had to endure the physical hardship of the body, and they had plenty of possessions and wealth, but they gave them all up by seeing them as things of little value and significance. Some of them were high officials of the court, and some were merchants, rich and wealthy men. All of them were fully possessed with great wealth, honor, and dignity. 
So why did they give up all of these things, take up the practice of Thamma, and finally attain Thamma and become famous? They attained the supreme state, and at the same time they also could see the insignificance of those things that they left behind. They were not the real things, and were not as worthy as Thamma, and that is why these people were able to attain Thamma, whatever class or family they came from, once they had gone forth in the Buddha Sasana, they then devoted themselves to the practice of Tamma with diligent effort. Even kings were able to give up their kingships and take up the lives of recluses or bhikkhus, just like any other bhikkhu. Look at the degree to which they were able to adapt themselves. For this reason, they were able to attain the status of great sages to whom we pay respect and esteem. We have to take up their example. During the time of the Lord Buddha, this was the only kind of undertaking or the only work that the bhikkhus were doing. This is the work of walking meditation or dangama, sitting in samadhi, and the work of pavana, mental development. This is the work of a bhikkhu. When they had conversation, they did not talk about politics or about business or about any other social activities. Nor did they talk about men or women. They did not bother about these things, because these things are the affairs of the world which they had left behind, due to the perception that these things are harmful. That is why they got away from these things, and made sure that these things did not come in and bother and disturb them. They only took up the tamma as their support, after they had left those things behind. All the work that they had done in the world, they had entirely let go of. The only work that they did now was the work of a bhikkhu, which is the samarna tamma or meditation, which slowly leads to peace, happiness, and tranquility. Wherever they were, they all disciplined and trained themselves with tamma, and they all consistently attained the result. They all attained the magga, pala, and nibbana in the various places like the forests, mountains, and caves. This was because they constantly exerted themselves. So how could the fruit not become apparent? When they carried on a dialogue, they carried on a dialogue on the Salleka Tamma, topics of effacing the defilements. These Salleka Tamma were the topics of their conversation, and when they talked about these Tamma, they were called Salleka Kata, which means the conversation about the way of deliverance, or the cleansing or the uprooting of the Gelesas. Salleka means to cleanse or uproot. And what does this consist of? What did those people during the Lord Buddha's time talk about? The basis of conversation for a samarna has bounds and limits. I will elaborate the first of these topics of conversation, although I have elaborated this many times before. But there are newcomers that may not have heard it before, so I will say it again. Please listen very carefully. The first topic is abitsada, which means one who is content with little. The Lord Buddha did not teach us to be content with many material things that are offered by the lay people. However much or little one might receive, one is only happy with just a little. This is the best way of practice. The second topic is sandorte or sandosa. Be content with whatever is available with regards to the requisites. One mustn't bother or make solicitations to the lay people concerning these things. One just uses whatever is available. This practice ranks second in moderation to the first practice of apitsada, being content with little. One has to be really firm and resolute if one practices in this manner. The third topic is Vivekata, delighting in seclusion. One has seclusion for one's dwelling place, and one guards the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body that have contact with the forms, sounds, smells, tastes, and tactile objects. And one also guards the heart, befitting the nature of the Samarnatamma, contemplative life. One cultivates the quietude or seclusion of the heart. If the heart is not able to find quiet, one will not be able to find any happiness. That is why it is vital that we curb and restrain the flow of the citta with our diligent effort. If we can find peace and seclusion, then it is possible for the citta to calm down. Then happiness will arise. And this is what is meant by vivekada, the delighting in seclusion. The fourth topic is viryarampa continuous and consistent exertion in all four postures of standing, sitting, walking, and lying down. One is constantly directing one's exertion with mindfulness. With mindfulness, it is then possible to exert oneself, and this is viryarampa, the topic of conversation on the application of diligent effort. The fifth topic, asanjakkaniga, means not mingling or socializing. 
One doesn't socialize with one's fellow bhikkhus or the lay people. The sixth topic is sila, morality. One strives to keep one's sila pure and to make sure that one's sila doesn't have any blemishes and lapses. One must protect and cherish one's sila the same way one protects and cherishes one's heart. Sila and thamma are one and the same thing. The coarser kind of thamma is called sila because it has to restrain and curb the actions of body and speech, with the heart responsible for their actions. The seventh topic is samadhi, calm and stability of the heart. One relates to another about the various techniques of practice regardless of what type of samadhi. One should talk about them because each one will be able to learn and gain some benefits from this talk. When one talks about samadhi, one can discuss and relate the various characteristics of samadhi. This is because there are many different ways of disciplining the jitta, following the different characters and personalities of people. The eighth topic is banya. One talks about the depth and profundity of the discernment and the various techniques of banya. One should discuss them so that one can share this information with one's fellow practitioners so that others might benefit from it. The ninth topic is vimutti, the state of deliverance. This is the most desirable subject of conversation and the most desirable state. It is the consequence that arises from a pizzada, wanting little, and all the way up to banya. The tenth topic is vimutti nyarna dasana, the knowledge and insight that one has attained vimutti. These are the ten salekathamas that the practitioners and the bhikkhus during the time of the Lord Buddha talked about. They only talked about the truth and thamma, which accords with the thamma that says ga le na thamma zakata, timely talk on thamma. This talk is timely and appropriate to the time, and they are etamangalamuttamang, the highest blessing for those who are involved in the conversation. And this is what they talked about during the time of the Lord Buddha, the salle kathamma. They did not talk about politics or business or about gain or loss. They were not involved with the confusing affairs of samsara like the way bhikkhus are today. In these bhikkhus' hearts and mouths, there is nothing of any substance but just the affairs of the world that they give vent to. They are not worth listening to. Can this be in accordance or in conformity with the time of the Lord Buddha? So, if this is the way, then all that is left is just the name or the label of one who has gone forth. Talking about the maintenance of his sila, one wonders just how much sila has he got. This is because when he talks, he does not restrain or have any reservations. One really wonders whether his sila has gone down the drain. So, how can one come up with any samadhi? Because not a word of samadhi has been said, not to mention the practice and development of samadhi and jitta bhavana, mental development. So, how can the result come forth? One just gets into trouble and confusion with the things that bear no benefit. Because we don't tread the way that the Lord Buddha showed us, we don't want to do the work that he wanted us to do. We only do the work that is opposed to Tamma. We do this constantly, so how can we gain sufficient worth or virtue to make us proud when our practice becomes wayward or tramples on and destroys the Tamma without us being aware of it? No truly beneficial results will come from this, leaving us to feel proud only of our status as monks. But what is the use of that? What is the use of being proud merely of our moral status? What use is it if we cannot be proud of the results that we can gain from our efforts in meditation? For these results, the fruits of our exertion, would be our own treasured possessions, be it the samadhi treasure, the banya treasure, or the vimutti treasure, these are the treasures that we can be truly proud of, those which arise from our diligent effort. These all start with a pizzada, the practice of wanting little, which counters the tendency to want a lot. And this is the way the Lord Buddha taught us to correct the gilesas, because the gilesas like to oppose and go against thamma. For instance, these ten thammas that we have mentioned earlier. In one of them, the Lord Buddha says a pizzada, take a little bit. But the Gilesas say, take a lot, take a lot. When you die, you can use these possessions as the fuel to cremate yourself. The Gilesas really like this. There is no need to look for any firewood because you can pile up your possessions, your wealth, and then set fire to them to burn your body. 
The Gelesas like it this way, and this is the way the Gelesas go against Tamma. The Gelesas will always go against Tamma. They will always go contradictory to Tamma. They will always oppose Tamma. Whenever the Jitta begins to like something, then please understand that the Jitta is already on the side of the Gelesas, and it has already been led astray by them. The Gelesas will proceed to put it up on the chopping block and cut it up into pieces. It is only when the Jitta has attained the realm of Tamma and the realm of truth, to the extent where one becomes confident of oneself, that one now understands the truth and Tamma, good and bad, within the Jitta. That becomes a different story. When the Jitta has attained that level, then the Jitta will be only inclined towards Tamma. It will like to acquire Tamma, and the desire for this Tamma is called Magga, the path. These desires are not gilesas like the other worldly or mundane desires. For example, Vivekada. The Lord Buddha taught us to be inclined towards seclusion, but the gilesas like us to mingle and socialize in noisy and maddening crowds. They are the place where the gilesas want to go, and this is how they go against Tamma. Vivekada, or the delight in seclusion, is on the side of Tamma. The delight in noise and madness is on the side of the gilesas. The Lord Buddha taught us Viryarampa, the application of diligent effort. The Gilesas say that we should apply our effort in the wrong way. If we go in the wrong way, then this is contrary to the Viryarampa. The Gilesas will always go against Tamma all the way to Vimutti. This is the nature of the Gilesas. They will always oppose Tamma. So one must always observe oneself well. No matter how the inclination might arise, one must use Zatibanya to investigate to see whether it is in accordance with Tamma or not. If it is not, then one has to realize that it must be in accordance with the Gilesas. Then one must immediately resist that inclination and let go of it, even though one might be really attached to it and really want to have it. For this kind of desire or attachment is really the affair of the Gilesas, but letting go of these attachments and desires is the affair of Tamma. If we are going to follow the way of the Lord Buddha, then we must let go of them. We must resist our heart. How can we not resist? If we are not resisting, then we cannot say that we are fighting, combating, and struggling. If we keep on following our heart's desires, then we cannot be called practitioners. We cannot be considered as someone who resists the Gilesas, fights the Gilesas, subdues and eradicates the Gilesas, and one who conquers the Gilesas, for one will always be losing to the Gilesas. This is not the principle of Tamma which exhorts us to oppose and to fight. We must always be constantly aware of ourselves. We only hear about the story of the Savakas. Some of them attained the level of Sotabanna, some of them the level of Sagadagami, some of them the level of Anagami, and some of them the level of Arahant in various places. These were the results that they attained. But what about the story of their exertion? What was it like? The story of their exertion and the story of the results that they acquired were in harmony with each other. Therefore, we must look both at the cause and the result, look at the means and the consequences. If we want the fruit or the result, then we must develop the cause or the means for this result to arise. It is like when we look for a certain plant. We observe and investigate to find out what sort of nourishment is good for this plant, so that this plant can bear the fruits for us. If we only look for the result without paying any attention to the cause that can make this result appear, then it is useless for us. We must look at the cause. That is, we must find out what kind of nourishment and fertilizer this plant needs, and we must take good care of it, protecting this plant from other things that can come and destroy it. It is the same way with our hearts. When we want the results to appear within our hearts, then we have to observe the heart to find out what it needs in order to be able to produce such a result. We have to eradicate whatever is antagonistic or harmful to the heart. Insects are very harmful because they constantly bite. Raga also bites, and Dosa also bites, and it is the same with Moha. Laziness and weakness also bite. Discouragement also bites. Thinking that one doesn't have the ability is another form of bite. Thinking that the Magga, Pala, and Nibbana are now out of reach or out of time, this is also another bite. These are all the bites of these insects, the Gilesa insects. Discouragement and weakness, they bite. When one tries to meditate, it's as if one is being taken to the gallows. This is another form of bite. They constantly bite us. When we lie down and our head touches the pillow, we don't want to get up. This is also another form of bite. 
Please note that these insects are in the heart. They hide inside and permeate the heart. They are constantly whispering and infiltrating the heart. We must get rid of them with the various techniques so that we can see and experience the supreme Tamma within our hearts. This will happen due to our diligent effort and our contention with them. In the beginning stages of practice, it is really difficult. Even though it is difficult, one will not retreat, but is willing to face it. One accepts the fact that it is difficult and that it is Dukkha. But then every form of work is difficult, because when one has to work, one must put forth effort. In our practice, we must also exert ourselves. It can be difficult, but we must exert to the utmost so that we can gain results that we can be content with. The jitta can be trained and developed, or else the Lord Buddha would not have taught us to do it. The jitta that has no tamma is like a demon. In such a jitta there is no tamma or truth, or any principle of reason. The only thing it has is the wish to acquire things according to its desire, and this is entirely the business of the gilesas. As a result, one will never be able to find any happiness either for oneself or for others. People tend to disturb one another due to the power of the gilesas. Human beings are social animals. They have to live together. They cannot live alone by themselves. So they always tend to disturb and hurt one another. And this is due to the harmful things inside the heart that have been vented. When one has constantly trained and developed oneself, then this wildness and recklessness inside the heart will steadily diminish due to the power of one's exertion. The jitta that has never attained calm will now attain calm. This is because we are now taking care of the jitta. We can have calm and cool-heartedness because of this care and nourishment arising from our exertion. We have to coerce and control the jitta constantly so that it doesn't think out beyond the way of tamma. We must not allow this jitta to think about the various things. We must direct it to only think in the way of tamma. The gelesas will gradually decrease, and the heart will then become calmer and more tranquil. Then we will begin to see the merit and value of the heart. We must then intensify our effort, because the benefit that arises from being calm is not the only benefit. There are other benefits that are higher and better than this.